Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to my talk. I am Anna Balmo, and uh, today I'll be talking to you about SILK, a system for uh, preventing latency spikes in log structure merge key value stores. This is joint work with Florin Dinu, Willis Vanopol, Karan Gupta, Ravi Chandiramurti, and Diego Didona. And uh, part of the work was done while I was in Internet Nutanix. So um, today's topic is uh, log structure merge key value stores, or in short, LSMs. These are systems that are designed for high throughput in uh, write-heavy workloads. They're meant to handle large-scale data, typically when the working set doesn't fit in main memory. And some popular examples of LSMs are Cassandra, Google's LevelDB, or Facebook's RocksDB. So LSMs claim to be efficient for write-heavy workloads, but is this really the case? This is what we notice when we run a Nutanix write-intensive production workload in RocksDB. This plot shows the 99th percentile latency on the y-axis and the time uh, on the x-axis, so lower is better. We can see that latency spikes up to one second in this uh, write-dominated workload. Now, the latency spikes are, uh, are making it difficult to provide SLA guarantees to clients, and also this unpredictable performance makes it difficult to connect LSMs in uh, larger system pipelines. This is where our contribution comes in, the Silk LSM key value store. Silk solves the latency spike problem for write-heavy workloads with no negative side effects for other workloads. And Silk dies so by introducing the notion of an I.O. scheduler for LSM key value stores. My talk will be structured in two parts. First, I'll present an experimental study that tries to uncover the reason behind these latency spikes. And in the second part of the talk, I will present our system, Silk. So what causes these LSM latency spikes? In short, they are caused by severe competition for I.O. bandwidth between client operations and LSM internal operations, which we can think of as uh, garbage collection. And to better understand this, let's take a br brief look at how uh, LSMs work. LSMs have uh, two big components, the memory component, which is uh, the write buffer, and the disk component, which is structured in several levels with uh, several sorted files called SS tables in each level. For the client operations, the updates are absorbed by the write buffer, and the reads need to go one by one through the LSM tree levels until the desired key value tuple is uh, retrieved. Now, in addition to client operations, there are also LSM internal operations. And this might seem like an involved explanation, but bear with me. It's important to understand this in order to be able to understand the solution. I classified the types of internal operations in LSMs into three. There's flashing, level zero to level one compaction, and higher level compaction. And it's also important to note that there's no coordination between internal operations in LSMs. So flashing happens when the write buffer is full. We install a new write buffer in order to uh, ab absorb the incoming updates while the flash buffer is written to level zero. Level zero to level one compactions merge one level zero SS table with level one. The goal is to make room on level zero for incoming flashes. Finally, we have higher level compactions, which can be um, um, seen as a garbage collection in the LSM tree. They discard duplicates and delete values by merging SS tables. These are less urgent than the level zero to level one compactions, but they still need to complete in order to achieve low latency. They're also IO bandwidth intensive, and we can also have many higher level compactions running at the same time. So to review, there are three types of internal operations, flashing, level zero to level one compaction, and higher level compactions. And there is no coordination between internal operations and client operations and between internal operations among themselves. Now, what causes the latency spikes? I'd like to mention that we noticed both the read and write latency spikes, but for this talk, I'm going to focus on writes because I think that it's less intuitive. Writes finish in memory, right? So why do we have these one second latency spikes? This can happen for two reasons. First of all, if level zero is full, we cannot flush. Let's look at a simple example illustrating this. 
assume that there is no room to write on level zero, so the flash buffer cannot be written. Eventually, the write buffer fills up, it keeps absorbing updates, and eventually, the updates will also be blocked. More precisely, because there's no coordination between internal operations, the higher level compactions will take over I.O., making level zero to level one compactions too slow, creating not enough space on L0, finally leading to not being able to flash the memory component. Looking at the same thing from a slightly different perspective, this is the timeline of uh, LSM internal operations. We have uh, flashing in blue, uh, higher level compactions in green, and a slow level zero to level one compaction in red. By the way, this is uh, a true example of um, a run that we observed in RocksDB, so it's not made up. Let's say that at some point uh, there's another flash, level zero is full. And uh, since it's full, we cannot flash anymore. Eventually, we are going to see a latency spike. The second reason, which is kind of like the first but with a different flavor, is that flashing is slow. This time, there is enough space to flash on uh, level zero. However, we can be unlucky, and we can have many higher level uh, compactions running in parallel. This restricts the amount of IO bandwidth that uh, is allocated to flashing, and the write buffer fills up before the flash buffer has a chance to be written to disk, thus stopping the, um, the updates. So again, because of no coordination between internal operations, the higher level compactions take over IO bandwidth, flashing doesn't have enough IO, thus flashing is very slow, thus the memory component becomes full and the latency spikes. Again, looking at this timeline of uh, internal operations in LSMs, we can have a situation where uh, many higher level compactions are taking over IO bandwidth because they're running in parallel, making the flash really slow because of lack of IO bandwidth, so eventually the latency spikes. What can we do about this? A first approach would be to use a compaction rate limiter. This is standard and uh, comes uh, with systems such as RocksDB. This is a simple attempt to coordinate between internal and external operations. However, this plot shows a timeline of the 99th percentile latency in RocksDB, where we limit the maximum compaction bandwidth to uh, 90 megabytes per second. And we see that static compaction rate limiting doesn't work in the long term, even if it appears to solve the problem if the experiment is short. This happens because the chance to run many parallel compactions increases with time as the bandwidth gets restricted. The second solution would be to somehow delay or be selective about the type of compaction work that we want to do. And this has been employed in many systems, for example, in Triad or uh, in PebblesDB. However, this timeline shows that also a system that's selective, like Triad, eventually comes to latency spikes. Being selective about compaction doesn't avoid interference because eventually the system will need to catch up and do the delayed compaction work. So what have we learned? First of all, we should make sure that level zero isn't full. Second, we need to ensure sufficient I.O. for flash and compactions on low levels. And third, we need to ensure that higher level compactions don't fall behind too much. This leads us to our solution, the Silk I.O. scheduler. The main idea behind Silk, and uh, if you want to remember something from this talk, this is it, is to uh, coordinate I.O. bandwidth sharing in order to minimize interference between internal operations and client operations. And we do this through an I.O. scheduler for LSM key value stores. Each of the lessons that uh, we learned from the study leads us to one silk design principle. So to ensure level zero is never full, we prioritize internal operations at the lower levels of the tree. To ensure sufficient I.O. for flashing and compactions on low levels of the tree, we preempt the higher level compactions if necessary. In order to ensure that uh, the other compactions don't fall behind too much, we opportunistically allocate I.O. for high, higher level compactions. Let me detail the first two principles, prioritize and preempt. So we prioritize the internal operations at lower three levels in silk. The first priority goes to flashing. The second priority goes to level zero to level one compactions. 
and the final priority goes to higher level compactions. We do so by allocating a dedicated flash operation queue and by allowing level zero to level one compactions to preempt higher level compactions. Our third silk design principle is uh, to opportunistically allocate IO4 compactions. And this, um, this is rooted in um, a real Nutanix client load, client load example that we noticed. So we can see from this plot that client workload isn't constant. So this, uh, this led us to the idea to continuously monitor the client, uh, client IO bandwidth use and to allocate less IO bandwidth to compaction during client load peaks and more IO bandwidth to compaction during low client load. As we can uh, see in this graph on the um, red uh, dashed line, if we allocate more IO to high level compactions during low load, we ensure that um, the compactions even on the higher levels don't fall behind. So how is SILK performing? Let's have a look at the evaluation results. First, I'd like to mention that SILK is um, implemented as an extension of RocksDB, and it's open source if you'd like to have a look. We first run the YCSB benchmark because it's a varied benchmark with different kinds of workloads, write intensive, read intensive, scan intensive. Our goal here is to show that in write heavy workload, SILK is much better for tail latency, and in the other workload, SILK is detrimental. So let's have a look. This plot shows the core YCSB workloads on the x-axis and the 99th percentile latency on the y-axis. We have silk in blue and RocksDB in red. So in this plot, lower is better. We can see that in the two write-dominated workloads, silk decreases stay latency by four orders of magnitude. Also, SILK doesn't affect read and scan dominated workloads. So we can see that the latencies are pretty much the same. Let us move on to the Nutanix production workload. This is a write dominated workload with 57% uh, writes. It is also bursty with peaks and valleys in the client load in the same style that I showed you earlier in the plot. The data set size is of uh, 500 gigabytes and on average a key value tuple size is of 400 bytes. So this plot shows Silk versus RocksDB at the 99th percentile latency. This is the same workload that I showed in the very beginning of the presentation for RocksDB. Again, we have RocksDB in red and Silk in blue, and lower is better. And we can see that Silk maintains the latency low and predictable, avoiding these um, large latency spikes. It achieves up to three orders of magnitude improvement over RocksDB in production workloads. Finally, let's have a look at the detail that's, um, that's interesting regarding stalling. So this plot shows on the y-axis the percentage of time in the experiment that the two systems spend stalling. Again, RocksDB in red and Silk in blue. And lower is better. We can see that Silk never stalls because it can always do timely flashing. If you'd like to uh, know more about Silk, about how it works, about more experiments and workloads, um, seeing that throughput is steady and close to the client load, and seeing comparisons with more state-of-the-art uh, systems, you are uh, welcome uh, to read the paper. To conclude, we introduced the new concept of an IO scheduler for LSM key value stores in Silk. We coordinate IO sharing in order to avoid latency spikes. And with this, we achieve three orders of magnitude improvement on tail latency in production workloads. Thank you very much, and uh, I will gladly take your questions. I've been the girl there. Uh, so I'm just curious. You said that you opportunistically figure out that uh, the client is not there's not client work, so I can I can spike up the ba background work. Yes. But then suddenly client can come up, and you, if you have taken the IOs, then the client will get impacted. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with that situation? And do you give up the IOs at that point? What do you do? So uh, yes, thank you for the question. 
Um, silk, uh, the granularity at which silk can uh, monitor the client load can be adapted, it's a parameter, so you can choose to check as often as you want. This might have some impact on, uh, on performance. But then after you realize that the client spikes um, in load, it's, um, it's almost immediate that you can throttle the compaction. So, so there's um, the delay between uh, throttling the compaction and uh, seeing that it has been throttled is really small. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, Ashraf from Purdue University. Uh, related to the same question, uh, uh, due to the uh, opportunistic uh, allocation of the throttling, uh, in your evaluation, you showed that you, you used YCSB. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think YCSB has this constant number of operations uh, per second over time. So how, how did you uh, evaluate the effectiveness of uh, this opportunistic uh, throttling with YCSB? So uh, thank you. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we run both. <laughs> so uh, we run both YCSB where the load is constant and YCSB that's, uh, that has these peaks and valleys uh, which are similar to what we saw in the production workload. Um, of course, if you run a peak throughput for a very long time, as we also show in the paper, eventually um, Silk won't be able um, to do anything about it because uh, there is too much backlog for compactions. So, uh, yes, indeed, if you have a peak, peak throughput, uh, the opportunist in compaction will just throttle the compaction. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jong Sang from eBay. Um, thank you for a great talk. And I think if you delay the higher level compaction, then maybe that may cause read performance degradation. So have you ever measured read latencies? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we have. So um, as I said here, I, uh, I focused on writes because uh, I thought it was the less intuitive case. But we, we have seen the same kinds of latency spikes in both reads and writes. And with our solution, um, both the read and the write latency becomes low. So there is, um, there is uh, very little, uh, I mean, there is no per performance degradation for reads. Uh, can I get some reason why read uh, mm -hmm. is also reduced? Sure. So think, uh, if we think about these higher level compactions that are getting, um, they're getting delayed, right? But even like that, on each level of the LSM tree, if we get to that point where we want to read from, uh, from lower levels, there is at most one file that we check because um, the files on lower levels have uh, non-overlapping key ranges and uh, we, have, um, we basically have one possible place. In addition, if we use the bloom filters, we can, uh, we can even uh, discard levels altogether if we know for sure that the key won't be in that range. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker again.